This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and joining me today on Global Connections is Ed Westergaard. Ed Westergaard is a geologist who's currently in Golden, Colorado, up in the high in the, in the Rocky Mountains. And let me welcome you to the show, Ed. Aloha. Hello, Carlos. How are you doing? Very well. Well, I'm delighted in our show today on Global Connections. Well, we bring, uh, you know, interesting guests that can share insights on different aspects of world affairs, uh, global issues, uh, helping really connect us to the world in different ways. And I'm excited the uh, conversation we'll have now with Ed that looks at some experiences he's been having now for some years uh, as a real, uh, I guess, uh, uh, pilgrim, a, a modern-day pilgrim. And, and more specifically, <laughs> we're going to talk about his adventures uh, traveling by foot, walking along the very famous Via Francigena. Francigena. Perhaps you'll, you'll clarify the pronunciation as you know it, but this is a very important common uh, well, ancient road and pilgrimage route that uh, runs from England, beginning in Canterbury, and, and makes its way across Europe, France, Switzerland, and on to the Holy See, uh, Rome, Italy. Uh, and so, Ed, uh, welcome to the show again. And let, let me ask you if you can maybe say a few words about uh, yourself. I know you're a geologist by training, but really you're a polymath. You're one of these people that has several different uh, sort of uh, expertise. Uh, you're, of course, you're a scientist as a geologist, but uh, an avid outdoorsman. And as well a historian, and particularly right now in this chapter of your life, you're looking to sort of combine these, uh, your understanding of, of environment, landscape, and through these experiences walking across Europe, uh, also helping understand maybe the importance of this historical trade route. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you, how you got interested in this opportunity and maybe just a few words about uh, your experiences so far with this, uh, with this pilgrimage route. Sure, Carlos. Um, I am a geologist, retired from the oil industry. And uh, with some extra time on my hands, I decided to pursue uh, another interest of mine, and, and that's history. Uh, fortunately, as being a geologist, really all I've done is gone from studying four and a half billion years of history to focusing on a mere <laughs> few thousand. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's actually a reduction in my, uh, my area of interest. Um, <laughs> but uh, in particular, I've always been interested in man's interaction with geology, or with the earth mm -hmm. writ large, climate, landscape, uh, et cetera. And so this has just allowed me an opportunity to, to dig a little deeper into that. And so I started a master's Excellent. at the University of Colorado, Denver, uh, in environmental history, and uh, just about ready to start writing my thesis and wrap it up. Excellent. So uh, very important, uh, very important to underscore as a lifelong learner. I mean, we never stop learning, and your education <laughs> goes on. It takes different paths. And now, in many ways, you're bringing that long uh, experience as a professional scientist, so your real passion for understanding, I guess, uh, landscape, places, uh, and it's one thing to study them or maybe even be involved in the nitty-gritty details of science. Now you're really pursuing this other venture, which takes you back to it's a long, long historical uh, tradition, this uh, long path. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this. Uh, this is called the Via Francigena. And I guess it translates technically into the route to, through France or something. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit, both uh, maybe what it has entailed and, and just describe what it, what it is for, for our audience. Sure. It's, a, it's an old pilgrim's route that goes back to the 3rd or 4th century uh, that um, was also a route of commerce and was, um, was mm -hmm. a military route. It's a little bit like the Ho Chi Minh Trail in that it's a combination mm -hmm. of routes uh, that have kind of mm. intertwined and, uh, and wandered and meandered and eventually mm. uh, showed up in Rome. Although I will say mm -hmm. uh, crossing several of the mountain passes would funnel those various routes into uh, its choke points, if you will, where, where uh, they mm. all became one route. And, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, so many important uh, cities uh, are along the way. Uh, that themselves mm -hmm. are pilgrimage sites. They have relics, uh, the remains of saints uh, that uh, mm. the people in medieval times, uh, even today, still come to visit to obtain a miracle or, uh, or, or what. Mm -hmm. so, but but my, my interest is purely uh, uh, secular, let's say. <laughs> 
But but quite fascinating because here again, I mean, this is a route that has been traveled now for gosh, you know, many many centuries, uh, and uh, as you noted, has a lot of historical relevance. And even today, in the more recent past, we have uh, places you go to that are uh, more recent memory, particularly the World Wars of the early 20th century. Uh, I wonder if we might show that one of the first graphics we have is an actual map, a map of this route that takes you. Uh, today it begins primarily in Canterbury, England, right? Uh, I think uh, yes. uh, that's where you begin to venture. And again, just to remind our audience, we're talking about a trek of about 2,000 kilometers, maybe what, 1,500 miles, or, or maybe clarify my uh, conversion there, but it's a trek that is done by foot. So you literally are walking and taking this long path and lots of little segments, uh, retracing this uh, classical uh, pilgrimage route. Um, if we have the map, it's showing us some of those. And maybe just describe briefly in your own words, I mean, what you're traveling through and, and maybe the type of sure. terrain that it goes from. Go ahead. Sure. It's, uh, you know, the way I do it is I slap on a backpack as wide as I can make it and carry everything <laughs> I need for the route. Uh, happily, uh, I can resupply as I need. Uh, I have uh, mm -hmm. finally, this year, I got rid of my tent. Um, and I, you know, my French has progressed enough that I can, uh, usually secure accommodation somewhere along the route every night, uh, at least so far I've been mm. successful. Um, yeah. and some of it's walking on roads, uh, which is, uh, probably the French drivers are more comfortable with people walking along the roads than an American is walking along the French roads. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so far, no, no, no incidents. Um, mm -hmm. but there are trails I walk through woods, uh, mm -hmm. you know, come to villages and towns. Uh, it's all sorts of, uh, variety, variety of terrain, but probably some of the most magical moments are when, uh, walking on actual old Roman roads, uh, the mm -hmm. stone that has been there for 2000 plus years, you know, it's still there. And some of the roads, you Incredible. can see the wagon ruts. Uh, I think we have a picture later on that uh, that shows yeah. that uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a varied route. Um, you know, you cross the the Alps uh, through the mm -hmm. Grand Saint Bernard Pass, uh, which is a historic entryway into into northern Italy. And Napoleon crossed there in 1800, um, mm -hmm. bring his army into into Italy, uh, and you know, the, the, the Apennines across Italy is, is extremely rugged, but very beautiful. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, no. yeah, so it's a, it's a wide variety of terrain. Quite amazing. And, you know, again, many historical markers, whether they be the Roman road you described or even uh, burial sites of, of famous, uh, you know, early pilgrims. But uh, I, I wonder if you might share with us a couple of the pictures you brought, which have to do with uh, perhaps some uh, other historical sites, the cemeteries that were sure. you know, from more recent wars. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about some of those photos. Sure. If we call up uh, that picture two, um, this is a picture from a place not called La Boue or near Le Bou. Uh, it's a World mm -hmm. War I uh, cemetery. It's a British cemetery. Mm -hmm. And this was mm -hmm. in the uh, area of the Somme battles in 1916. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, right here, there were, you know, about 3,100 graves representing men from the UK, Canada, and New Zealand. And mm -hmm. it's, um, it's one of the things I find fascinating because landscape is both a, an accomplice to history in that the landscape mm -hmm. helped dictate how these battles unfolded, but the landscape was mm -hmm. also an archive of history. And so mm -hmm. for World Absolutely. War One, that archive is in the form of cemeteries and memorials. Uh, yeah. And the British were unique in how they um, handled the, the cemeteries and with the Commonwealth Grave Commission actually left most mm -hmm. of the cemeteries where they were originally. So then maybe there was a, uh, a forward medical unit uh, that had casualties, and as these soldiers uh, uh, expired, uh, they were buried, and that's where those, those became cemeteries. Uh, and those are cemeteries mm -hmm. that are there today, although they have been mm -hmm. uh, uh, cleaned up, and they all have the same Portland stone headstones. Um, mm -hmm. and, and whether you were an officer or a private you had the same type of headstone. It's a very democratic mm. 
uh, <laughs> burial. <if laughs> burial, <you will. laughs> yes. Uh, but but quite a you know but, again these, these are moving places that you see and of course anybody who studies that period of particularly World War One was such a vast uh, you know deadly conflict so many lives lost. And today, it's commemorated in these memorials, these cemeteries. I wonder if we might move through. We have a, a number of pictures to go through. And just to, to maybe sure. before we come to a break, let's look at a few more real quickly and see what else you can share. If we move on to the yeah. next one, I think that's uh, number three. Yeah, so this is uh, an example of the, the first cemetery I showed you is what they call the collections or a concentration cemetery. So it originally mm -hmm. was a small cemetery, but they started bringing in bodies and remains from uh, other cemeteries and, and the battlefield as they were found after the war. Mm -hmm. But then here's an example of two very small cemeteries and are hard to see, except for you can see the two crosses uh, sticking up. Those are called the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Great Cross or the War Cross. And um, again, these are made out of Portland stone. They're at almost every British cemetery. And as you're walking along the Via Fontagina, you'll just see these things sticking up in the middle of nowhere. And uh, mm -hmm. go by, usually go by and, and you know and visit them and, and document what people are writing and uh, and and mm -hmm. try to learn a little bit about where this what that cemetery is about. The other interesting thing mm -hmm. about this this picture, if you look off in the distance, there were two slag heaps, or in French, what they call tourelles. and these mm -hmm. are important part of this landscape because this is why the Germans are here. Um, the Germans mm -hmm. wanted the resources of this part of France. In fact, it later mm -hmm. became, mm -hmm. because they had captured this area, they didn't want to let it go. Uh, and so it actually mm -hmm. prolonged the war when uh, the Allies and some of the initial fantasies of truce that were being offered by the Germans, the Allies declined to, to give them this. But uh, mm -hmm. also mentioned that those slag heaps are now UNESCO heritage sites. <laughs> um, oh, which is kind of kind of weird. But... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another interesting thing about that is that when I was in another cemetery near near here, uh, I noticed all the Polish names, and it was a civilian cemetery, all the Polish mm -hmm. names. And so I asked my a friend me. of mine who lives near here, and he goes, oh, yes, after the war, there were no men left. So they imported uh, people from Poland to to work the mines, and there's still a big wow. Polish population, and their descendants uh, there. Yeah. yeah, and of course the Poles have a long connection with the uh, with the Britain in particular. Even in World War II, a large uh, community that was there during the war. Uh, quite fascinating. Well, uh, we're going to get close to a break in a moment here, uh, but uh, okay. I wonder. Uh, we've looked at just uh, some initial ones, and again, it underscores how this is a route. Of course, we're looking at really more recent in the past century, but uh, as you said earlier, it, it has uh, markers and then maybe even burial sites. I know it was a route where many in those early days would make themselves, uh, I guess, who are interested in making their way to Rome. This was the, the classical path coming from the UK, from or, well, England at the time, and coming from uh, France and, and on the way down. And, and so today it has now been established. I, did, I believe the European uh, Union itself has given it a special status now as, as a cultural yes. you know, heritage site. Cultural route. Um, so yep. what we'll do... It's a cultural route. What we'll do is we'll take a short break right now and come back to continue a fascinating dialogue about this. Uh, I'm your host here on Global Connections, Carlos Juarez. I'm joined today by Ed Westergaard, a geologist uh, and an outdoorsman who has uh, spent some time now walking the famous Via Francigena, which is a, a trade route. I'm not a trade route, sorry, a pilgrimage route and an ancient route that goes from England to Italy. Uh, and we'll come right back with more on the story. Please join us in just another minute. This is ThinkTech Hawaii, raising public awareness. For more than 100 years, American Humane Association has been teaching kids to be kind to animals. Those in our homes, on the farms, on the silver screen, and wildlife conservation caring for the world's vanishing creatures. But we can't do it alone. Visit kindness100.org to find ways to teach kids how they can make a more caring, compassionate and humane world for all of us. Aloha, I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday, aloha. 
Aloha, we're back here. I'm Carlos Juarez, your host on Global Connections here on the Think Tech Hawaii series, and we're delighted to be having a chat today with Ed Westergaard. Ed Westergaard is a geologist uh, based in Golden, Colorado, where he joins us from the Rocky Mountains, uh, and we're talking about some of his travels and travails. For some years now, he's been doing a very fascinating you know, long, long hike, uh, 2,000 kilometers long, that takes you from England, uh, ventures through France, through parts of Switzerland, and ends up going through Italy to arrive in Rome. And this is a, a very ancient route that's been traveled, uh, gosh, for millennia, it seems like. Uh, and uh, today it is also now being sort of revitalized, and, and even some of the European countries, as it's recognized by the European Union as a, a what, what was it described, a cultural uh, a cultural route, path or uh, route. Uh, I was even reading some about how in Italy, as it goes through many parts of Tuscany, they've also kind of begun to give it more attention. Uh, and I wonder, as, as we continue uh, this chat, Ed, uh, tell us a little bit more about you know the experience itself. You've, you've, you've got a few more pictures we'll turn to in a moment. But as you've trekked yeah. along, I mean, what, what have been some, some of the interesting anecdotes or stories, things that have surprised you along the way? Uh, obviously, this is something that you know some people know about it, but there may be some who have no clue what you're doing. And here you are walking for uh, – and right. maybe tell us as well – how long does the journey take? It's a pretty long trek. Well, how many well, days are you actually literally walking? Yeah, last year when I actually walked the entire route, it took 100 days. Uh, but I took a few oh, days gosh. off. I went to visit some <laughs> friends in Paris. But uh, well yeah, deserved. 100 days. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, in France, it is not very well developed. It's poorly marked. Mm -hmm. uh, you're at the mercy of guidebooks and your maps. Uh, yeah. Once you get to Switzerland, it becomes a little more uh, easy to follow. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're never really able in the Via Francia genome to sort of switch off. Uh, you always mm -hmm. need to be cognizant of where you are, uh, mm -hmm. especially in France. Again, when you come to crossroads, uh, you, you better make sure which way you need to go. Um, mm -hmm. In Italy, it is very well developed. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a huge support system for it. There's lots of accommodations. Um, mm -hmm. It's very well organized. And it's, it's actually an economic boon for some of the local communities. Mm -hmm. That's one of, the, one of the goals of the European Commission when they put together the Culture Route program was to create an economic uh, a bonus mm -hmm. for communities. Uh, that, that, was, exactly. that was one of the aims. So, yeah, right. an accommodation in France is a bit dicey in particular because – Mm -hmm. So many people are leaving, moving away or moving out of the countryside uh, to the big cities. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is everything yeah, is for yeah. sale in the in the villages. So, mm. but not yeah, so much so, in yeah, Switzerland. It's a, it's a, and, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And, uh, well, and, and let's take a look at some more photos that you've got with us to share, and uh, maybe you, you call up the numbers that you've got there and give us a quick overview of some of the pictures you've taken. Yeah, why don't way. we go to to picture eight? And this is a, a picture of a relic in, um, in the town of Cormacy in the Champagne area of France. And this was the place I visited mm. last year, and the church was closed. This year, was, I happened mm. to arrive just when a, a lady was opening it up, and she figured out mm. that I was a pilgrim, and she uh, gave me a tour of the church. At the end, I asked her, hey, are there any relics? You know, my, my best pigeon French. And uh, she kind of <laughs> smiled at me and motioned me to the back of the church and took me to the sacristy. You know, this is like the locker room oh, for, the, uh, for the priests. <laughs> and inside yeah. the sacristy, or uh, on a plain table, is this beautiful reliquary. And I couldn't believe it when I looked at it and I saw it was a rib bone of St. Remy. And wow. St. Remy is, is an, a, an important uh, piece of French history, or he was an important bit of French history piece of French history, and that he was the man who, or the bishop, who baptized Clovis, converted Clovis to Christianity, mm -hmm. and Clovis in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, early 6th century was the first, uh, what we consider, king of France. So it was, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's really his bone, but um, people believe that it is, and those mm -hmm. relics carry a huge amount of power even today amongst the uh, mm -hmm. the believers, if you will. But it's uh, it, oh, I, I am fascinated by them, and it's, uh, they're, they're really mm -hmm. fun to see. Wow. Um, Let's see, uh, what else you might share with us here? Uh, if we go to Picture 9, St. Maurice. Uh, this, this is uh, from the cliff. Oh. 
Mm-hmm. Is it Switzerland? Yeah, or what, what Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, we're in Switzerland now. Uh, this is the oldest Western monastery in continual existence. Uh, it was mm-hmm. established in the uh, five, early 500s. And if you look to the right of the or left side of the picture, you can see the steeple of the of the monastery. Um, mm-hmm. Saint Maurice, it's to me, this is a fascinating tale of landscape, in that um, to the north of Saint Maurice, and we're, and we're kind of looking north northeast in the picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Rhone River Valley is very wide. As you come to Maurice, it's neck mm-hmm. down by a big outcrop of limestone. It creates this cliff that I'm standing on. Mm-hmm. And so it was a perfect place to, de- to, to place soldiers to defend the high passes mm-hmm. into Italy. And that's what uh, yeah. Diocletian did in the uh, 300s or the 200s uh, mm-hmm. to put down some revolts in Gaul or in France. And so there's this yeah. guy from Egypt, uh, the thief, uh, Maurice, who was the leader of the Thebian uh, Legion, and they happened to be Christians. And he was ordered to persecute the local Christians. He refused. His legion was decimated. Uh, He refused again, and he was killed, along with all those officers. Anyway, a couple hundred years later, he becomes a saint. And Mm -hmm. this, uh, um, this monastery is built up around that legend. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, the reason it's there is because of the limestone that made it such a defendable position, defendable position for the armies. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's all actually always been sort of a holy place because there's a huge spring there. And so there's uh, uh, artifacts going back to uh, early, early pagan times. Um, mm, fascinating. Uh, so, yeah, so it's this... this um, Connection between landscape and history again. Mm-hmm. And, quite, quite, uh, quite a the, spectacular view. You can see the spectacular view that you described already. I mean, a very strategic location, helping them to defend uh, uh, this, uh, these passes so they could control access, of course. Uh, yeah. Maybe we've got time. Let's move to one more, and we'll try to finish up because we, we're nearing the end of our show here. But uh, give us a quick snapshot yeah, of another we'll go to one picture of your photos 10. here. Picture 10 I alluded to a few minutes ago. This is the consular road to Gaul or France near a town mm-hmm. called Pont Saint Martin um, in, in northern Italy. Uh, so mm-hmm. this road was built in the first century BC. Uh, and if you actually look, there's kind of a, a columnar looking object there. That's a mile marker. Yeah. And it, it actually has the number 36 on it in Roman numerals, <laughs> uh, which is a distance to the town, a large town of Aosta, which is uh, mm-hmm. roughly about 50 kilometers from, from here. I'm not sure exactly what Excellent. their distance uh, metric is. But uh, if yeah, you look yeah, there on the stone, you can, you can see the ruts that are in the limestone uh, and are in the, in the stone uh, on the road. And that's uh, it's my favorite hiking partner, partner my wife, Melanie, uh, <laughs> there in the picture for scale. And also that art that you see yeah. in there, was, was mm-hmm. you know, actually dug through by the Roman engineers. And it's, uh, oh, it's wow. amazingly smooth. And uh, wow. now th- these roads are really, uh, really fun to walk along. And especially once you start getting mm-hmm. to Switzerland, you get to walk along chunks of them for uh, extended periods. And Italy wow, as well. Wow, quite remarkable. It's quite fascinating. And I wonder, you know, here you are in the modern, you know, early 21st century, of course, enjoying the privileges of, you know, better quality equipment than maybe St. Martin or other <laughs> pilgrims had in previous days. I wonder, as we get near the end now, if you might just share a quick uh, answer to, you know, what are the kind of either items, a uh, couple of two or three items that you are just grateful to have or that you make sure you pack in that backpack that you get, sure. uh, things that you've learned from, from experience or, again, that are obviously things that maybe earlier pilgrims wish they had, but you can't go without. Right. Well, having good Indi- boots is, uh-huh. is, you know, indispensable. Um, <laughs> moleskin or blisters or any sort of blister uh-huh. maintenance. Uh, yeah. You know, trying to keep blisters from or yeah, blisters are brutal. Uh, and ibuprofen. Yeah. Uh, it, those uh-huh. are probably things that uh, I, I I value most. And the other thing probably that we don't think about that I have today that my. Uh, uh, fellow pilgrims in the past didn't have is a simple map. Uh, They didn't have maps in medieval times, or at least not as we think Mm -hmm. of them. So 
yeah. how you knew to where you needed to go next uh, must have been uh, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, on one hand, we do have these modern technologies, but even a basic physical map, do you find yourself still unfolding a, a, an actual oh, paper map absolutely. or not at all? No, yeah. I, uh, I, I, you know, I use my phone as a navigation aid too, but uh, I'm old school. I still like, I still yes, like yes. the map, and you know, batteries wear out. Uh, That's right. Things happen yeah, to I know it's important, uh, and and especially you know, as as an educator myself, I you know, I've got students that I work with that can't imagine a life without a smartphone. Well, guess what? You know, you have to learn to to be a bit more resourceful and actually look at a map, open it, unfold it, etc. Well, it's been a fascinating. We've got a couple more minutes to wind down here, Ed, and maybe uh, if there's another one of these photos you could share, one that uh, set of uh, remarks about, and we'll bring closure to our overview today. I've been fascinated by this, uh, uh, you know, your experience both as a geologist who kind of understands, you know, things like, you know, rocks and, and the earth, but, but now seeing it from <laughs> a more historical vantage point uh, brings a different perspective, helps you connect the two. Uh, maybe sure. there's uh, one more maybe... that you want to speak to. How about picture seven? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I, I just throw this one up there because, um, you know, a big focus of my study is there's a memory of World War One in the landscape. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, at least that's yeah. what my thesis will, will heavily dwell upon. And um, this is part of what they call the iron harvest in France. So every year the mm-hmm. farmers, they dredge up tons, literally tons of, of unexploded ornaments, old uh, mm-hmm. shells, bullets. And these are pieces that mm-hmm. I found in about 10 minutes in a sugar beet field. And uh, wow. didn't take them home, most of them, but uh, it was just, uh, it's amazing to find these things out there along these fields. We just don't think about that at here mm-hmm. uh, in yeah, terms yeah. of uh, uh, archives and history. Yeah, fascinating. And of course, again, you know, just that, that war, particularly World War One, left so much, uh, you know, of this there. And again, 100 years have passed, but here you are still today, every day bringing out uh, the legacy of that. Well, this has been a great uh, conversation, Ed. I really appreciate your opportunity to share, uh, you know, insights of, of your experience traveling this ancient route, this pilgrim route from uh, Canterbury, England, through France, through Switzerland, through the Italian uh, land all the way into the Holy See, uh, the Vatican today, uh, and it's a route that people like you who are modern-day pilgrims are sort of making sure that we understand and, and, and appreciate this historical context. Uh, it's been a great uh, conversation. I thank you for that. Uh, for our listeners, I'm your host here, Carlos Suarez, on Global Connections. Thank you, Carlos. A good example of, 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 of helping bring together, uh, again, a world traveler like Ed, who is uh, embarking on, uh, on this journey uh, of the ancient trade, uh, not trade, I keep saying trade, but it's the ancient pilgrimage <laughs> route uh, that uh, it took many, many, and even today continues to take the modern-day pilgrim. So we will close on that. I thank you for all our listeners uh, joining us here on Global Connections. Uh, we'll be here again in two weeks for your next episode. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ed, for joining us as well. Aloha. Thank you, Carlos.